Well, amen. Thank you to the choir and orchestra for leading us in worship. Hopefully you realize that last uh, song, uh, that, that was not uh, the lyrics of a songwriter. Uh, every bit of that last hymn was the words of the Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2, and verses 6 through 11. Um, as we now enter uh, into our time devoted uh, solely to the Word of God, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for your presence with us. Uh, you are here with us. Whether we're here in this worship center or we're tuned into this broadcast somewhere else, you are by our side, and we are thankful. And Father, we, sp we feel your spirit moving. We ask that over... In these next few minutes, as we read and meditate upon your word, that your spirit would continue to move. Open our eyes to truth. Convict us. Comfort us. We pray that we would be changed through encountering you now. And as the one with the task of preaching, I pray that I'd be faithful to the Word of God alone. That if any of my words, my thoughts slip in, that those things would be forgotten. And that the Word of God would remain. We pray these things, not in just any name. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I vividly remember my very first meaningful spiritual conversation with my dad. I had been a pastor for a handful of years, and my mom and dad made a short trip to visit us. My church at the time was holding a special service, and my mom and dad showed up to show support. I thought it was a kind gesture. Uh, but my dad had something a bit more in store. After that service was over, I was in my vehicle alone with my father, and we were headed toward lunch, and then my dad initiated the conversation. It was short. It was to the point. My dad said, I spent 34 years in the military. And through that entire 34 years, I placed my career ahead of my family and my faith. That was his confession. And then he said, I'm sorry. He said, I could be filled with regret. But he went on to say, I won't look back. He just made the promise the things moving forward would be different. My dad, as he had always been, was faithful to his word. From that day forward, he began to seek the Lord with all of his heart. He began to daily read his Bible. He began to pray. He began sharing his faith with anybody who would listen. He began to faithfully serve his church. He's a man of his word, and his seeking of the Lord transformed every relationship he had to include the relationship with his family. It deepened on that day. A few years after that very first meaningful spiritual conversation I had with my father, my father felt a call to ministry and accepted a pastoral position at his church. I, I tell you that story because it's my personal favorite story of a life changed by Jesus. We have now entered our 10th week. Some of you think, has it been only 10? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's only been 10. Um, our 10th week in our Stained Glass Disciple series. We're, we're looking at these lessons that can be learned 
or modern day disciples, from these original followers of Jesus who accepted the invitation of come follow me. And our guide through this series our, is our very own rose stained glass window which contains images which depict the life story of the original followers of Jesus. We've been taking the disciples in the order presented to us by the window. And this morning we come to Matthew, who's depicted in our window by three money bags. And if you were here last week, you realize that we, we have now gone through all the images in the rows of our rose window. Uh, we're now in the images that are on the outer edges. If you see Jesus in the center of our window, if you follow Jesus' gaze straight out at 3 o'clock, you'll see Matthew's three money bags. What can modern day disciples learn from the life and ministry of Matthew. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. If you're headed that way, can I hear a big, loud amen? amen. We're discussing Matthew this morning, and I picked one of the passages where he's referred to as Levi. This is not a mistake. He goes by both names in our gospel accounts. Luke chapter 5, verse 27, and the word of God reads, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, known as Matthew elsewhere, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. What can we as modern day disciples learn from the life and ministry of Matthew? Well, this morning I have two things for you. And the first is this. Disciples experience life change. Disciples experience life change. As a tax collector in Jesus' day, Matthew collected a, a specified, a specific amount of tax from his fellow Jewish citizens. And because of that, he was viewed as a, a traitor. He was one working for the opposing, governing Roman government. And he was seen as one who benefited from legalized robbery of his fellow citizens. In Jesus' day, the, the tax collector collected a specific set amount of taxes. And, and anything he could get above that specific set aside amount, served as his salary. So the tax collectors were, were shunned, seen as ones worthy of disdain and, and distrust. And throughout our Gospels, we, we actually see the job of tax collector used as another word for sinner. We have one account in Matthew 21, 31, when Jesus is trying to make a specific point where, where Jesus puts tax collectors 
and prostitutes side by side. Yet, here in the passage we read moments ago, Jesus walks up to Matthew's tax booth and says, follow me. This one seen as an outsider, as a low life, as a traitor, as one worthy of disdain and distrust. Jesus walks right up to his tax booth and says, follow me. He offers him the same invitation as he offered the disciples earlier in the chapter in the beginning of of Luke 5 verses 1 through 11. We've been in that passage in this series. He offered them Matthew. The tax collector, he offers him the same invitation. Come, follow me. I have to admit, this must have been shocking to the disciples who had already signed up. He had already called a a collected group of fishermen early in the chapter. They've already left everything behind. They've signed on. They're following Jesus. And here's Jesus going to a tax booth. And he offers the same invitation. Must have been shocking. But as we see over and over in the gospel, Jesus has no interest in crowd pleasing. Jesus has no interest in winning popularity contests. He looks at Matthew, says, Follow me. And you look at verse 28. Matthew referred to as Levi in this passage. Le- Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Jesus offered the same invitation to Matthew that he had offered to the disciples earlier in the chapter. And Matthew responds here in verse 28 in the same way as those disciples did in chapter 5, verse 11. Those previous disciples already on board, left behind boats and nets. And here Matthew leaves behind ledgers and tax receipts. Life has changed. By the grace of Jesus, his life is transformed. I want you to sit with that for a moment. Matthew's life change, way back here in Luke chapter 5, should provide you and me hope right now. Sit with that for a minute. Way back. Luke chapter 5, Matthew's life change should provide hope to me and you right now. Jesus redeemed Matthew's life and he's willing to redeem us as well. Jesus picked Matthew up from his life of sin and he's willing to do the same for you and for me. Disciples experience life change. My second word for you this morning His disciples change lives. And it's a bit of a play on word on that first point. Disciples experience life change. And then as a result, disciples change lives. Yet another dramatic display of a changed life. Jesus offers the invitation to Matthew, come follow me. For whatever reason, Matthew understands that he's in the presence of 
the Messiah, and he says yes. He, he willingly leaves the ledgers and tax receipts, and he begins to follow Jesus. But we read this passage from verse 27 to verse 32. Uh, Matthew leaves the previous life. He drops the ledgers and tax receipts. He follows Jesus, and then in the next scene, in the next breath, Matthew throws a banquet in Jesus' honor. With, with a new direction in life, Matthew wants to introduce his friends to the one who has turned his life right side up. I love the story. There's so much detail in here that we quickly breeze past, but Matthew's going to throw a party in Jesus' honor. And who's there? Well, the tax collectors and other sinners. Well, why is that? Well, who else does Matthew know? No one else would accept the invitation. And these are his friends. He has experienced a life change. He has encountered the Savior of the world. And his first thought, my friends must know. Throws the party, invites all of his friends, and of course he invites Jesus. Disciples, and hopefully we've picked this up over the course of this series. Disciples, don't hoard the good news of a Savior. But rather they generously share that good news with everyone they know. Especially they're friends. As many preachers have said before me, this life of discipleship it is merely one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. But of course, we, we read this story and Jesus dining with those deemed as sinners doesn't sit well with the religious elite of the day. It's curious. Again, there's lots of details here. There's a lot. It's a short passage. On, on the surface level, it doesn't seem too complicated, but it, it provides all sorts of questions for me. Um, the religious elite of the day, they aren't at the dinner party. So where are they? Are they peeking in the windows? Right? Has, has the rumor mill gone around and they know that Jesus has not been invited with a bunch of tax collectors? Surely that can't be. I have to see that for myself. I don't know what brings them there. But it doesn't sit well with them. And then we're told that they ask the disciples. They, they complain to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Perhaps, maybe this is, the party's over, maybe everybody's coming outside. I don't know how this interaction happens, but the religious elite of the day go, disciples, why, 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 why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? What I find really curious, the disciples don't respond. They ask the question to the disciples, and it's as if Jesus steps in and says, I've got this one. As if Jesus is saying, this one's too important. Let me answer it directly. Let people quote me and not you. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Michael Card, you might know him as a singer-songwriter, but he's, he's also a, a well-known biblical scholar. Michael Card reflecting on Jesus' response noted, I find it fascinating that Jesus does not reject their distinction between the righteous and the sinner. 
It is only that when given the choice, Jesus chooses sinners. Those who are well see no need for a physician. But those who are sick will will call a physician, for they are well aware of their need. That seems like common sense. Those who feel as if they are healthy and well see no need for the physician. Those who are sick will call the physician because they're well aware that they are sick. But that's not even what's happening here. Jesus doesn't wait to be called. But he calls the sick. He says, I I have not come for this, but, but I have come for this. Jesus is stating his purpose. He's giving a vision statement, a person, a, a, a personal mission statement. I have come for this very reason. And in my mind, I, I hear um, echoes of, of many Old Testament passages. I hear specifically Jesus living out a passage like Ezekiel 34 where like a physician, like a a physician doing his proper role is to attend uh, to the sick, uh, the proper role of a shepherd is to seek out scattered sheep and care, care for, and and treat, and strengthen those who are lost, injured, or weak. She said, this is why I've come. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm sitting at the table of one you've cast aside as sinners. Jesus has come to gather up, to to heal and care for and strengthen the the injured and the weak. And he lets us know that that healing process begins with repentance. It's the starting point. Our English words where we get repent and repentance actually come from a Greek word that literally means a change of mind. We typically think of repentance and and we think of behavior. Yes, that's a part of it, but that's the end product. The word actually means a change of mind. When we encounter Jesus, our thinking has been transformed. Our our thinking has been renewed. We we now think of ourselves in a different way. We we now think of Jesus in a different way. We now view sin in a different way. And with the transformed mind, with the renewed mind, we then change our actions. Matthew's a great example. He hears the invitation, follow me, from the Savior of the world, and he gladly accepts it. He now views himself, he now views Jesus, he now views everything differently. And he immediately throws a party so that other sinners can find a Savior. Disciples experience life change and then change lives. If you were here last week, I I assigned homework. I'm not going to ask you to pass it to the front. Uh, We might try that down the road. I don't know if that would work. Um, But if it worked, I'd probably try it. Uh, I'll pray on that. A bit, but my homework last week, um, 
I encouraged you, as ones who have encountered Jesus, go, go invite one. Go invite some to, to come and see the Jesus that you know. I asked you, invite someone to church. Invite someone into a spiritual conversation. How'd that go? How'd that go? Scanning faces, pastorally mind reading here, uh, feeling a bit of the tension in the room. It appears I need to extend the deadline on the homework. You're, you're coming back to me and you go, I, I didn't know there was a deadline here. I thought that was kind of like an open invi invitation to do this. Um, let, let's try it again. This week... This week, out of your understanding that Jesus is the Savior of the world, out of your understanding of everything that we have lifted up in song today, as one who has moved from death to life, Moved from death to abundant life and death to eternal life. Go share the good news. Share the good news that there's a Savior who has died for sin and rose from the dead, defeating sin and death. The stained glass window of First Baptist Sulphur Springs depicts Matthew with three money bags symbolizing his previous life as a tax collector. Tradition teaches us that after the events of the New Testament that Matthew traveled to Ethiopia and preached the gospel. And he preached the gospel unto death. We have stories that Matthew was crucified on a tau-shaped cross. It's a cross that looks like a, a T, a cross without the top piece. We have these stories of him being crucified on a tau-shaped cross. And then upon his death, we have stories of him being beheaded. But prior to his death... By the grace of God and by the Spirit of God, Matthew collected his Jesus stories and penned a gospel that bears his name. As you sit in this sanctuary each week, may you gaze at our window. May, may your eyes fall upon Matthew's three money bags, and, and may you be reminded of the changed life Jesus provided to you. And may you be reminded to share that good news. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for every person I'm hearing the sound of my voice, whether that's here in person, that's through a TV screen, whether that's an internet connection, or whether that's a radio broadcast or a telephone app, There's countless ways in which people are hearing my voice at this very moment. Father, I'm thankful for each person. Each person is one for whom you have died. Each person hearing my voice is one for whom you rose from the dead. May we grab a hold of what you provide to us. May you overwhelm us with your grace. May we feel your forgiveness of sins now. Father, I pray that. There's some person hearing my voice that is struggling hard with sin. 
may they encounter the forgiveness and grace that you provide them through the cross and the empty tomb. Now, may they hand it all over to you. Father, I pray for all of us that we would encounter you and that you would give us boldness, that you would give us courage, conviction to go and tell the good news. This week, may we run, may we be eager to speak of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray these things. So thankful that you hear us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to spend a few moments.